This episode is sponsored by JDAQA Software Testing, your scalable solution for manual, automated, security, and performance testing. Check us out at JDAQA.com. And with that, let's get on with the show. This is The First Customer, hosted by Jay Agner. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the First Customer Podcast. Today, I am lucky enough to be joined by Scott Berman, probably the only NBA statistician I have had or will ever had for your Philadelphia 76ers, co-founder of multiple cannabis companies, venture capitalist guy, co-founder of the Panther Group, co-founder of a company called Audience Partners we're going to talk about a little bit. Scott, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing great, Jay. Thanks for having me on. You're welcome, man. I love your background. It's all over the place. But let's talk about where you started, where did you grow up, and kind of did, did that have any impact on you being an entrepreneur? Yeah, for sure, man. Uh, I grew up in Philadelphia in the suburbs, and uh, my father had a business in Center City, Philly, uh, manufacturing jewelry. So I kind of grew up in the jewelry business. And, you know, a lot of hustling in this town. You know, people just are always on the go. There's a lot of businesses. There's a lot of different types of companies. So I grew up in the city basically working and really seeing that environment. And, you know, it definitely, I learned a lot as a young guy and I'm still learning today. Did you, are you a fan of Uncut Gems, that movie? Did you see it? It was a, it was a pretty interesting I don't think my heart has still come down from the intensity of that movie. Was it at all like real life? It was. As a matter of fact, it was especially relevant for me because of the connection to basketball and jewelry. Right. And so like NBA players coming into a jewelry shop to buy jewelry. I had that experience when I was, you know, a young kid. And so really? it was very, it was especially relevant from both of those sides. Wow. I didn't even think of that connection, but that makes a lot of sense. I think you went to University of Maryland. Right? What'd you go to there for? I went there for business mostly. Yeah. Okay. Business major. I like to say I majored in my fraternity though. Um, to be real about it, but I had a really great, unbelievable experience there. It's a great school and I have a lot of lifelong friends from it. Beautiful. So I see, you know, obviously, heavy in the cannabis space along the way. We talked a little bit before. And talk to me a little bit about the NBA statistician. I think you're almost at 35 years or something being there. How did that start? Where did you, how'd you get into that? So my father was actually the shot clock timer for the 76ers starting in the late 50s, actually. So I wow. was born into it. And when I was a young lad, he would take me down to the games and he would be working and he would hand me the program, you know, and I would just, he's like, keep score. So I would just keep points and rebounds and stuff in the book. And over the years, I worked with a guy named Harvey Pollack, who's actually a famous statistician. And I just lo loved doing it. And then when I got out of college... They said, you want to work here and work the game? And I was like, you're going to pay me to do this? Okay. <laughs> I've been doing this for fun for years. Oh. So I just sat down and they put a computer system in. And some of the older guys that had been working there weren't really that great with the computer. They had been doing things by hand. Mm -hmm. I was able to learn the computer program pretty quickly. So I just earned my way into the, to the spot. Wow. Where did you, where do you sit at the game? Well, I used to sit right down in the middle of the table mm -hmm. on the floor, but uh, a number of years ago, they actually put in high roller seats there and they moved us upstairs. Okay. So we sit across the court like 20 rows up now. Okay. Cool. Favorite sixer of all time, I'll have to ask Ooh. you. Oh, that is. Dang. Just have to do I have to do it to you. Man. I, I mean, jo Julius Serving, I guess, would be the, because the, uh, my childhood, Dr. J was probably my favorite. Um, I love the Iverson too, and you know. I, but I would say, if you have to pick one, it would be Doc or Charles Barkley. Mm. I love Charles Barkley too. Yeah, I love how much he puts his foot in his mouth these days. <laughs> so not even for like anything political, just like he's stupid great. stuff. He, he's like the best. Like he's the best yeah. for sound bites like you'll ever find. Uh, he's a so, super duper nice guy too, by the way. On the side, yeah, he's a real gentleman. And what a great guy. Yeah, yeah he, he feels like he would be a, a stand-up yeah. guy. All right, so talk to me a little bit about how you got into venture stuff and how you, so, I mean, I saw, let's maybe kind of meander a little bit, kind of fast forward through some of the, from your business, you did the NBA statistician stuff, but you also did all this other stuff. Like, how did you, how did the other stuff fit in? So I, I while I was uh, in the jewelry business, I learned how to do AdWords, Google AdWords to sell jewelry. And I really liked AdWords a lot. And in fact, it was a lot like basketball stats, actually, with, click-through rates and conversions or like field goals and assists and stuff. So 
I really enjoyed doing that. And I started um, doing AdWords for a lot of different companies. And then uh, in 2008, co-founded an agency to do politics and healthcare using digital marketing. And so I sort of transitioned out of jewelry into the advertising world. Hmm. Became really interested in ad tech, lots of different types of ad tech, programmatic marketing and publisher site buys and all that sort of thing. And that, and through the politics of that business, that's how I originally got into cannabis. Okay. We worked on a lot of political issues and I got a cannabis client that was working on ballot initiatives in different states and running ads, you know, vote yes on cannabis. And I started to see after the votes happened, what would happen in that state. You know, first it was Colorado in 2014 and then Oregon and Alaska. And one by one, these states started to legalize cannabis. So my partners and I started seeing a, a big opportunity to invest in that space. So I started going to trade shows and I found a lot of good opportunity. And so we started to invest in companies. We, we started one company in Oakland, Cali. And then in 2017, I got into the venture fund side of it to really look across the whole you know, scope of cannabis. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So I guess Jersey was the latest one around here that went full recreational, right? So... What's PA's timeline on that, do you think, yeah. to, to go full recreational? It's a, it's a good question. So what's happened now that's interesting is not only New Jersey, but you also have New York, you have Delaware and Maryland, mm -hmm. you have Massachusetts, you have a, almost all of the East Coast now flipping from medical to adult. So Pennsylvania is now surrounded by <laughs> adult use states. And I know a lot of people now that are driving across the Ben Franklin Bridge here and buying weed in Jersey from a retail store, you know, right. and they don't have a PA medical card. So I believe that that's going to put pressure on PA to do it soon, hopefully by next year, you know, like it's an election year and Governor Shapiro's in favor of it. So I think it'll happen. Hmm. But, you know, Pennsylvania is known to do a little, do some weird stuff. You know, we have some weird alcohol laws here too. So you never know. You just started seeing beer at Wawa like yeah. too long. Too long ago, so that yeah. was... Sorry, to talk to me a little bit about audience partners. I mean, you, you co-founded that company. How did you... Was that the 2008 company that you... Yeah. For the, okay, so how did you pivot from the jewelry business? And I'm sure you learned a lot about business and like I said, AdWords and a bunch of marketing stuff. But running, working at a company or being in marketing company is a totally different thing than going and starting your own business, obviously. Yeah. How did you make that pivot and kind of what was the process to starting your own business? Well, you know, I'd love to say it was smooth and easy, Jay, but it wasn't. You know, the jewelry business was not great. And my father, unfortunately, had a lot of illness during those years. And so I was trying to figure out different ways to, to help the business. I realized that the online stuff was working better than anything. You know, mm -hmm. a couple hundred dollars on AdWords was going a long way. So I started to do AdWords for other companies, you know, to hustle and make money. And I realized that I could do that for any vertical. I just had to look at the website and pick out keywords. Right. And then I could get into AdWords. And so a couple of friends of mine decided to do this political business and they needed like the ad tech guy. And so they said, hey, we want to do polit AdWords for politics is really how it started. Mm -hmm. And in those days, which, you know, it was right before Obama ran for president and he changed the game for online advertising for political campaigns. In those days, about two to three percent of a political ad budget was spent on digital. Most of it was direct mail and television and radio. Right. We we guessed that it would be it would grow, and you know it has, of course, grown a lot over the years. So, you know, we just saw we saw an opening. We knew that political advertising was sort of antiquated. You had to buy a pen a television. Dia, what am I thinking of? Like the area that you buy. I lost track of the name of it. Um, something what is it called like anyway i'll think of it in a few minutes you had to buy like more than one state is what i'm trying to say mm -hmm. so you want to advertise for a, a congressional race in suburban philadelphia you had to run ads in new jersey too because it's the delaware valley tv we figured out that you could do zip code advertising and target zip, you know zip codes and you could look at every voter who lived in that zip code and tailor the message to that audience mm-hmm so that's, we knew there was an opening there. So we formed our company and very quickly we, we got new business because we knew that people like wanted this stuff. They didn't understand it. So my job was to go explain it to people in Congress and tell them why this was better than them spending millions on television. So who was your, I don't have to name names, but who was your first customer? How did you, 
how did you actually get them to buy your service for the first time? So yeah, this was a cool story. We went down to DC and we, we did a panel. We did a speech somewhere. I forget what the event was, but we talked about using Google AdWords for political campaigns. We actually had a guy from Google that was a guest of ours and we put together this great panel and there was a lot of political operatives in the meeting, you know, in the audience. And so afterwards, you know, they came up, a bunch of them came up to us and said, I, I really need to learn more about this. Hmm. So I, then me and my partners, we made up, we set up appointments with people in down in Congress and we brought down, you know, spreadsheets and, you know, PowerPoints and stuff. And we showed them how much more we could do with a limited budget, say 25 or 50,000 bucks, you know, as opposed to millions on TV, we could reach every voter in your district and send them six messages, right? Stuff mm -hmm. like that. And we could also personalize the message so the Republican female would get one ad and the Democratic male would get a different ad. Hmm. And so at these, you know, and it was like, for me, it was simple zip code targeting a congressional district. To them, it was revolutionary. Like, you could do that. I'm like, yeah, yeah. Google does that all the time. Right. We basically, the idea was that we brought a technology that had been used for many years, you know, in a lot of other verticals, and we applied it to an underserved vertical in politics. Wow. And you were doing the statistician stuff at the same time? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I've always done that. That's always been my night job. <laughs> now, do you use that at all in your pitches or anything for your other businesses? Do you kind of bring it up that you? that you're part of that world? That's funny. I usually don't, I, but people know, and people want to talk about that more than my other jobs, actually. Right, right. Um, but it does add some, it adds a little bit, I think, of some credibility to who I am. I mean, like, yeah. you know, because I, I have that understanding of data and analytics. I, I think I did get a little bit more trust from people on that. Mm -hmm. But it was also, as I mentioned earlier, though, I love learning about this stuff. Like, I really love ad tech. I read newsletters every day. I love AI now I'm really interested in. And so it really helped me, like, be the subject matter expert when I went to, into a meeting that I was interested in how the analytics would affect your business or your business, you know? Right. You can say I'm talking about artificial intelligence now. Alan Iverson, that can be yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. I would use no, that all day, right, right. but it's it's an I mean it's a good point though. It's a fair point. Like, if you have something interesting, it's an opener sometimes, or it's a separate. It's a conversation that like as long as you're weaving things in and out, and you keep it about what you're talking about, you can kind of express some of your experience. Like I have, it's very purposeful that this picture is behind me because people see it and they go, "Oh, it's a cool picture." Of it. And I say that's the first one I ever had printed. The, the stuff I shoot, and they go, "You shot that." And that starts the whole thing about astrophotography. And it's just, it's not, I'm not saying go out and do cheap sales tactics, but there, if there's things that you're passionate about and you're interested in and you're part of, there's no reason why you can't use that to add credibility to, to your other things. You see, the, I don't know if you can see this, Jay, but right over my shoulder here is a little statue of Will Chamberlain yep. when he scored his 100th point, 100 point game in 1962. Yep. That's like a little thing of him. And I'm like, yeah, you know, like I just put that in my background. You know? Dude, like, that's, there's no reason not to. And honestly, yeah. That's way cooler than like the 10 different degrees on the wall, which like yeah. doesn't really do anything for anybody anymore. If you've got a cool little thing that like, you know, yeah. either in person or, or in virtual that you can bring up, there's no reason not to do it. So tell me a little more about the Panther Group. Like you mentioned, you're kind of like venture funding stuff and you're kind of feeling out the industry as a whole. Like how did just from a 50,000 foot view, how does that work when you're like, you know, you've worked at a business, you started a business, you kind of, and I think it's a natural progression. I see that a lot, but it kind of does the, and they go to venture because it's kind of like you get to touch a lot of different things. How did you make that transition? And like, what does your day to day with the venture kind of side of thing looks like? So what happened was we started investing in these companies. And at this point, we have over 30 investments in cannabis companies and we're in 20 different subsectors. And, and everything, every company is different, obviously, but the, the, the state that they're in is different if they're a technology or if they're a plant touching business. And a lot of them are immature companies. And, you know, that's just because the industry is new and it's especially new in, in certain states. And so they need a lot of support. They need capital. Everybody needs capital to get going. But what we realized was after the capital came in, they needed a lot of other executive level support. So they would need, this could be financing help, you know, like a CFO, certainly, you know, a marketing director, advertising solutions. And so we didn't want to just be the venture capital guys that just gave money in and said, when's our return coming? We want to actually help you with the journey. 
And it's important, like, because there's a lot of things that that encompasses, you know, certainly helping them grow to the next level, raise more money in two years, you know, maybe do an acquisition in four years, maybe have an exit in eight years, you know, we help you do all of that stuff. But in between, we also help you just get more customers. So I like to do a lot of business development. Uh, I have a big network in the industry. So it's like, you know, I have a guy that sells lights. I, I'm going to introduce him to a grower. I have a guy that sells software. I'm going to introduce him to a retailer, you know, or I have a brand that I think is great and I'm going to get them exposure online or something like that. Mm -hmm. So I found that there was a lot of other things that we can do. We also act as, you know, like senior leadership mentors. I like to think of us as therapists sometimes because cannabis is wacky. It's not an easy road. So, you know, a lot of times I'm working with entrepreneurs to manage the ups and downs of the mm -hmm. industry. So it's a good thing about being a little older, Jay, is like I have a little bit more, you know, wisdom of being, being in, in and out of businesses for all these years, you know? Right. Very interesting. If, if you, this is a little bit past the vein that I normally go, but since I have somebody with your level of experience and, and expertise on it, if you were going to tell somebody that's interested in getting into the venture world, what would be step one for them? Good question. So first of all, I would, step one would be to figure out a vertical. That's, you know, let's say you've already figured out that vertical. I would certainly try and meet it already. Whoever's doing venture well in there, try and meet them. That's one thing you learn from other folks. That's one smart thing that I did early on in the venture days is I got together with a couple guys who had 25 years experience doing venture capital in different industries. And I listened very closely. I was for a couple of years, I was on calls a couple of times a week and just listen to how the questions come out. How do you work with an entrepreneur that's trying to raise money? How do you like read a pitch deck and financial report or projections and really understand what's going on? So, you know, and I did a lot of homework on businesses. So like when I would get a, a pitch deck in from a company, I would look at, see who their competitors were, you know, what's the differentiator and what state are they, are they operating in, mm -hmm. you know? And so just, you know, really before you make any decisions, you really got to understand the landscape of the business you're looking at and the specific sector that they're in. Interesting. Yeah. And how would you suggest people find or is it just reaching out, you know, to people that you find on LinkedIn or if you're looking for people in a vertical for virtual, you know, say it's whatever, say it is cannabis. You know, are they going on you know, the forums to find the venture folks? Are they going on LinkedIn? Are they going to networking events? Are they going to conferences? Like, where would you start trying to find those people? First, I would say all of the above because everything you mentioned is very relevant. Certainly... The conferences in cannabis are specifically are very good. Every conference. I mean, I used to do advertising conferences and I did really well there too. So going to conferences and listening to speakers, you know, talk about what's going on in that industry and then meeting them and then making friends with them is really important. Mm -hmm. But when there's not a conference going, then the next best thing is LinkedIn, I think, you know, and following people and seeing the articles. I read so much stuff on LinkedIn, like, and, and I follow a lot of my VC buddies and they'll post something about an investment that they made or the state of the industry. I read that stuff. I like to see who, you know, what they're investing in and what deals they're looking at and how well their track record is so I can make better decisions for our fund. Hmm. Yeah, no, I like that. I, it took me a while to understand how to attend conferences properly. And <laughs> like you go there for the first few years, like, I don't even know. Yeah. What I'm supposed to be doing here. I and mean, as you said, like the more you go to, you kind of get a rhythm, you get figure out what you're going for, who you're going to talk to. I think the advice to go, if somebody said the other day, I think it was somebody who used to work for Chris Sarah in Arkwood in Philly. He said, Chris always says, rush the quarterback. You know, the talk is over, right? Like just go right for the guy. Yes. Don't let anybody get in your way. Go talk to the guy that everybody was there to see, introduce yourself and try to make that connection because that's probably the most powerful one in the room, which sounds kind of similar to what you're saying. So I've had many times. I'm going to Toronto for a collision conference this weekend. And I think uh, I'm going to try to do the same thing. I'm going to do a lot of rushing the quarterback this weekend. Hopefully. Yeah. My other tip for conferences actually is happy hour. Yeah. And dinner. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
I'm always strategic about what am I doing after the show floor closes at four or five o'clock? Where am I going to have drinks and who's going to be there? Because there's always, you know, events. And then gather 10 people, six people and go to a dinner together and eat, break bread mm-hmm. with important people and make friends with them. And then when you're done, you're closer to them and they say, hey, I'd love to learn more about your venture fund. You know, can we connect on a call? So the social part of the show is more is important as well as walking around from booth to booth. Right. Yeah. There's so much noise. I mean, physical noise and just like attention noise at those conferences yeah. during the day. So I think it's a really good point to yeah. get some people where it's quiet, where you can talk about stuff and listen to what people you know, have to say. Because nobody gives a shit what you're selling at these conferences. Like <laughs> everybody's there to sell their own stuff. That was one yeah. of the you know, biggest things I learned. So what what are three kind of health things that you're focused on, mental, physical, whatever it is? Like, what are three kind of your biggest health things you're going after as an entrepreneur and, you know, a co-founder and a founder and all these different things, like keeping yourself tuned up for the long run? You mean health, like physical health? Physical I, health, yeah. yeah physical, mental question. health, whatever it is. Well, it's a very good question for me because I focus on that a lot. I mean, I focus on mental health. Uh, every day, you know, meditation, mindfulness. I, I study Buddhism. I've been practicing for years now. I have a Zen Buddhist teacher that actually, we're launching a podcast actually about Zen really? entrepreneurship. I'll share. Oh, it's beautiful. Yes. I would love, dude, I'm like, I'm dying to know more about Buddhism because I'm a huge meditator and I feel like the worlds have to collide at some point. They do. And so I met my Zen Buddhist teacher during the pandemic, actually. I'm sitting at home, like, you know, wasting time, really. And I'm like, let me do something productive here. I read a bunch of books about Buddhism and then we connected. And he's a coach for entrepreneurs. Hmm. too. And so I was like, you know, I have, there's always issues in business. So, you know, this is just a good suggestion anyways. Talk to other people that are businessmen and women and tell them you're, what's going on with your life. It helps a lot. Mm-hmm. And so during the course of this, I, I realized that this was helping me with my life and my business, you know, and that's also in addition to the therapist that I have a therapist for a long time since I got divorced about 15 years ago. And I really appreciate my therapist, you know, and I work with him and, you know, and then it's just like that. I like the gym. I, I walk a lot. I swim I'm really into the gym and working out and hiking and things like that. And, you know, the older you get, the more you have to just increase your effort at mentally and try and eat healthier too. So I, I think about it literally every day of how I can be a little bit healthier than yesterday, mm-hmm. you know, and I'm still here. So that's good. I like that a little bit healthier today. Yeah. And so I call it the mystery question. What would you do outside of business, non-business? What is something you would do if you knew you couldn't fail? If you couldn't fail. Okay. That's a great question. I, I would say off the top of my head, uh, I love the the water and the ocean and I love boating. And I think I would take a ridiculous boat trip of some kind, like sail somewhere crazy. Okay. You know, if I knew I couldn't, I mean, I probably would be worried about failing that, but (laughs) if you said, Hey, you're not going to have any trouble uh, on your boat trip around the world in a sailboat or something, that would would probably be something I would do. That would be cool. I like that. I like that a lot. Every time I ask that question, I've recently started to think swimming across like a major, you know, like something crazy, like the yeah. ocean. I mean, like from, from America to Europe would be, if you couldn't fail, that'd be pretty cool. But I love circumnavigating yeah. the globe on, yeah. on a sailboat. That's cool. I yes. like that. All sailboat right, well, with a nice big cabin and a kitchen and a ship. Yeah, yeah. Not, not like anybody. a, no, not, you're not roughing it. You're not roughing it in this, yeah. this hypothethical like you know, you you're, you're comfortable on this right. this non failure trip. That would be great. Yeah. All right. Well, dude, you're awesome. I love this. Thanks, this was man. great. I, you know, that was not. I had no idea what to expect. Uh, a statistician. I didn't know. You know. Uh, I'm not a numbers guy. Like, so thank God there's people like you on Earth who enjoy numbers. I love your story. I love the venture funding and all the different stuff. So I hope somebody picks you know some pieces up from this and and you know learns a couple things from. If people are looking to reach you or Panther Group or any other, you know, organizations, now the time to plug it. Who, you know, how do they get in touch with you or your organizations? I would say the best way is really LinkedIn. Just, you know, I'm easy to find there. I'm on it all the time. So just look me up. Scott Berman, Philadelphia, PA. The new thing that we're doing, the Game of Zen podcast, we'll be, we'll be promoting it soon. 
we have a YouTube page now for it, but we don't have it officially out there. So I'd love for people to check that out. And right. yeah, I mean, I'm always happy to talk to people, especially entrepreneurs that are looking to do something in cannabis or other verticals. You know, I love talking to new people. So awesome. Well, you're an awesome guy. I can tell the, you can tell when you talk to somebody that practices mindfulness and, you know, just, I mean, look, I got five kids, I got a lovely wife, but I run a business and this podcast. So I'm certainly, you know, it, that's what they call practice, you know, because you're always practicing and, but it's very nice to meet someone with such a cool story and a, and a calm demeanor. So keep spreading the, the love, man. I, I appreciate you. All right. Well, it's been great, man. Scott, be good. And we'll catch up soon. All right. Thanks a lot, Jerry. This is a lot of fun. Thanks, man. See you.